everyone. If you uh, have your Bibles today, guys, we're going to um, take a look, first of all, at Isaiah 61, or excuse me, Isaiah 60, 60. And uh, I'm going to kind of read through some of this for our um, Old Testament and New Testament reading today. I was going to do those as we actually begin the service today. And so I'm just going to read these scriptures to you a little. We're going to start here in Isaiah 60, and then we'll, we'll flip over to um, Revelation after that. But I wanted to uh, make sure that we, we start here, and then we'll come back and, and begin. Let me make sure I've got everything there we need. Okay. So Isaiah 60, I'm going to read um, a large portion and then um, actually jump over to Isaiah 65, but I'll direct you. Okay, Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you, all assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah. And all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense, and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. All Kedar's flocks will be gathered to you. The rams of Nabaioth will serve you. They will be accepted as offerings on my altar, and I will adorn my glorious temple. Who are these that fly along like clouds, like doves to their nest? Surely the islands look to me. In the lead are the ships of Tarshish, bringing your children from afar with their silver and gold to the honor of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has endowed you with splendor. Foreigners will rebuild your walls, and their kings will serve you. Though in anger I struck you, in favor I will show you compassion. Your gates will always stand open. They will never be shut, day or night, so that people may bring you the wealth of the nations. Their kings lead in triumphal procession. For the nation or kingdom that will not serve you will perish. It will be utterly ruined the glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the fir, and the cypress together to adorn my sanctuary, and I will glorify the place for my feet. The children of your oppressors will come bowing before you. All who despise you will bow down at your feet and will call you the city of the Lord, Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Although you have been forsaken and hated with no one traveling through, I will make you the everlasting pride and the joy of all generations. You will drink the milk, the milk of nations and be nursed at royal breasts. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring you gold and silver in place of iron. Instead of wood, I will bring you bronze and iron in place of stones. I will make peace your governor and well-being your ruler. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders. But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light. And your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. Then all your people will be righteous, and they will possess the land forever. They are the shoot I have planted, the work of my hands for the display of my splendor. The least of you will become a thousand, the smallest a mighty nation. I am the Lord in its time. I will do this swiftly. I'll skip over to the last of Isaiah 66. I'm going to read 22 and 23. As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. 
from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. Amen. In our New Testament reading, I'm going to go over to Revelation chapter 21. And I'm going to start in verse 1 and read down a little bit. I'll give you a moment to make your way there. Revelation 21. Okay. Revelation 21 and 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children." But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And I'll skip down to verse 22 now. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation 22, 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light or a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, as we look at our message for the day today, I really wanted to start off with just the, the statement again from Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. This verse, I believe, is for everyone who is trusting in the name of Jesus Christ. The light of God has shined upon you. Think about Isaiah 9 where it says, Those in darkness have seen a great light. The light of Christ has come. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who walks in me will never be in darkness. He is our light. The glory of the Lord is Christ Jesus our Lord. We have so much to, to talk about, but before we start, I want to make sure that we say this is a new fellowship we've established. This is our third week now as the Fellowship of the King. And I want to reiterate that it is the fellowship of the king. That article is very important, right? The. It's not a king. We're not the fellowship of a king, another king, some king. We are the fellowship of the only true 
one King, Jesus Christ. Amen. And He reigns over all things. We have a lot to do as a, as a church, not just us, but as a church in all the world. There's a lot that God has called us to do on this earth. And we're going to address a lot of things in the Scriptures. But before we do, I want to make sure that it's very clear to anyone here or listening later is that we want to keep the one thing, the main thing, and that is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the only way to eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus said that whoever believes in me will never die, but will live forever and ever. Right? The Word says that by one sacrifice, Jesus has made perfect forever those who are being saved through Him. He is the way. The most important thing that we can ever say, proclaim, believe, or know is that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that through Him we could become the righteousness of God. We have been reconciled to God. We have been made His children. Though we were dead in sin, He has made us alive in Him forever. This is our hope. And when we pass away, this flesh passes away. Because our soul will not die. Jesus already said that. Even though we die, we will live, He says. We're going to go to be with Him forever because of what He has done for us. He has purchased us. He has redeemed us. He has made us. He has saved us to be His children forever. That is the, the main and only message. If we had one thing to say, if we, if we got one minute to make our case to the world as God's ambassadors, be reconciled to God, this is what we would say. But now, we're going to realize that that is our foundation, right? The the church of, of Jesus Christ is built upon him as the, the cornerstone, the foundation of the law of the prophets, all that was written before. And now we are being built up into a kingdom. And that's where we're going to start talking about this kingdom of this king. Because you can't have a, a king without a kingdom. A king has to have a kingdom. And, and this world, we believe, is his kingdom now. And there is so much to say and talk about in that. But we're, we're going to have to do a little bit at a time. Otherwise, every sermon would be about five or six hours. So we're just going to take little nuggets at a time. I want to refresh us, though, kind of where we've started in our, in our messages and how we've gotten to where we are, okay? So let's remember in our Bible, and, and we believe that this Bible is, is one story of the King, Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, it's, it's one story. And... We want to go back and remember that at one time, after Adam and Eve sinned and were kicked out of the garden, there was still the mandate to mankind to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth and fill it. And man was doing that, but at some point in Genesis 11, it says that man found a, a plain, a wide open place in, in a place called Shinar. And he said that I'm not going any further. We're going to stop right here and we're going to build our own kingdom. And it literally says that man said, I'm going to make a name, not for God, but for myself. And they were going to build their own temple and uh, some kind of tower that would reach to the heavens, that they would basically be the lords of their own heavens and earth. And God said, no, that is not my plan. Since this is what you have decided to do, from here I will scatter you. And he did. He scattered the nations. He confused their speech. He gave them all a different language. And then he set rulers, principalities over each of those nations. And he had disinherited them. They were not his people anymore. And then in our very next chapter, in um, chapter 12, he calls Abraham out. One man to build a new nation. A special people. A chosen people. And that through that chosen people, it said, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So fast forward, that's our, our, uh, an understanding that at that time, there was one people, God's chosen people, and they became what was called the nation of Israel. And then there was the rest of the world 
categorized all under one heading called the Gentiles. Basically, everybody that wasn't God's chosen people. But don't forget that the promise was always that through that chosen people, all those nations would be blessed and brought back into God's family through faith in a promised coming Messiah, the promised coming King. That is, that's where we started. And then last week, we looked at the fact, though, that somehow today, we've kind of come into the understanding that God still has these separated peoples and the chosen people of Israel and we, we talked about and cleared up and go back and listen to last week's sermon that no, through the gospel now, through the coming king, the one who came, Jesus Christ, the nations have been blessed. All who have faith in Christ now are able to be part of this chosen people of God. And that chosen people of God is also called Israel. Now, don't confuse the name Israel with the name of natural people, like any more than you would confuse the, the name uh, of Israel with, with Russia or any other nation. This is a chosen people of God who have faith in Christ Jesus. And we talked about how and why it's important that we know those things. Anyway, that's just kind of summarizing up because now that brings us to, we talked about it briefly last week, that sometimes in the history of the church, we have come to times when we have needed to have reformations. And when I say the history of the church, the church is the called out ones, we said. The church is the, the New Testament way of saying Israel, God's chosen people, because there is only one people of God. There's only one way of salvation, that's through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, when Jesus Christ, that promised king, came, we said that was one of the needs of a first reformation because God's people had the Bible confused. And we talked about how it's like they had the scripture like a box of puzzle pieces, jigsaw puzzle pieces, but the lid that they were looking at to cover that box and make their puzzle out of had a different picture than what God had really chosen for them to know. They had a picture of a, an earthly king ruling over an earthly nation and ruling all the other nations, and the need for the reformation of that time was to understand that no, no, it's not going to be an earthly kingdom in Jerusalem in this one place any longer. And we went through a lot of that. I won't re-preach the whole sermon, but you know it's interesting that, that Jesus literally said in John 4 that there was one place on earth that you would not worship him, and that would be Jerusalem. But that you would worship him not in a place, but in a manner, in spirit, and in truth. We're going to talk about that more next week when we get into the nature of this kingdom, of this king. But we're just reiterating, making sure that we understand where we are, why there was a need for reformation, because the people at that time did not understand Jesus was the king and, and what that meant for him to be the king, what that kingdom was supposed to look like. They had a completely different picture. And we noticed that they refused, on the most part, except for a small few, they refused to change their picture. They held to their own teachings, traditions, and understanding instead of letting Jesus teach them that, well, you've heard this, you think this, but this is what I tell you. This is what I say to you. And they rejected Jesus, but that was part of God's plan. And through that, he saved us, and the church began to grow. A small group, God began to grow his church. And then we came to another place in the 1500s where another reformation was needed. The church had completely confused everything we said. I won't re-preach the whole thing again. But we came out of that reformation correcting a lot of errors that were in the church. And we, the truths that we came out, we, we labeled them as five what they call solas or onlys. And those were simply that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed in the Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. And those were the main things that needed to come out because man had confused, the church had confused things that you were saved by works and not by faith. Well, that brings us to, again, the third Reformation, which I believe is now. There is a new Reformation that needs to happen. We need to continue to build upon the other two. What's the first Reformation taught us? That Jesus Christ is the King and that He has an established an eternal kingdom and that all who believe in Him are able to be a part of that kingdom forever. And then the second Reformation, we don't ever want to forget the, the lessons of that, that we're saved by grace through Him and faith in Him alone, not by works that we do. 
and that we don't need anything to add to what Jesus did for us. He has saved us and made us his children and his people forever. But now, it seems to be, in our world, the church has, for a long time now, been very confused again about what the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King, looks like and what it is and when it is and the need of it. And so now we're going to begin to look at that this week. And I'm just laying foundations because, again, there is so much that it would take too long. I I just want to set the stage and then we'll come back next week. Um, And when we come back next week, we're going to look at why do we... Why do we uh, need to clear up this kingdom confusion again? What is it? And that there is a lot of error and misunderstandings about the kingdom. And we're going to talk then also about when is the kingdom of Christ. We're going to talk about the fact that we believe that it is now the kingdom of Christ. And what is its nature? What What does it look like? Where is it? How do we know it's here? We will deal with all those things. But this third reformation again, guys, that is... That is what we're working on clearing up the confusion. Why do we need to clear up the kingdom confusion, though? We need to establish the fact that Jesus' kingdom is now, and we need to grow it to start and to correct misinterpretations of the Bible that we can flourish. And one of the main ways that we're going to do that is by going back, just like they did in the Reformation, just like Jesus had to do, and they're going to go back in Scripture, and we're going to examine the Scriptures to see Jesus the King and His kingdom. Okay? So, as we do that, I encourage you guys to don't believe anything that I say always, but always go back to your Scripture. And I encourage those who may be listening to this at a later time even to to go back to your scriptures as well, okay? And when, when I say something about Jesus Christ's kingdom, and maybe it sounds odd to you because I said there's a great deal of confusion right now about the kingdom. So I may be saying that there are some things that aren't going to be what you've heard. Well, I encourage you first, before you do anything, to go to your scriptures and look at what I'm talking about. Okay, don't just run off and ask someone or YouTube it or Google it before you look at your scriptures first. And that is based on the principle of what's called being a good Berean. And what that's talking about in the books of Acts, the Apostle Paul came and was teaching people about Jesus. And they said, well, that's very interesting. And it says what they did was they went to the scriptures and examined them to see if what he was saying was true. So when I come to you and I tell you things about Jesus Christ and His kingdom that may be different than what you're hearing today, don't take my word for it. Go to the Scriptures. But also, don't take anyone else's word for it. Don't be lazy and say, well, what is this teacher that I always like to listen to? What does he say about it? Don't, don't, don't do that first. First, go to the Scriptures. Then when you read the Scriptures, fine, go, go and hear what your, what your teacher says about it. But don't ever forget, guys, as we talked about last week, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the rulers and elders of the people, they got Jesus Christ completely wrong. And they crucified Him. What would have happened to you back then if if somebody had come to you and said, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And they'd have been like, oh really? Let Let me go ask my chief priest about that. What would he have said? That's impossible. Jesus can't be the King of Kings. He can't be the Lord of Lords. Because, you know, we know where he's from, yada, yada. They had all these biblical, quote-unquote, reasons that he wasn't the Messiah. Same thing. What if in the 1500s, this monk Martin Luther had got up and said, Everyone, I know the church is telling you that you're saved by works, but I'm telling you you're saved by grace through faith. Look at your scriptures. What if they had been lazy and said, well, instead of that, I'll just go, I'm going to go find this uh, Catholic priest I know real quick. I'm going to go say, hey, Catholic priest, I heard that uh, Martin Luther saying you're saved by grace alone through faith alone, not by works. Oh, that's impossible. The Pope's been teaching that for, you know, years and said that that's anathema. That's, that's not true. 
Don't read your Bible. Don't worry about it. Just believe what the church says. Well, in the next few weeks, I'm going to be challenging you very much. I'm going to be telling you things that if we were in the first century, it would be completely disagreed with. I'm going to be telling you some things that in the time of the Reformation in the 1500s, the entire church at that time would have disagreed with and probably would have burned people at the stake for, which they did. So as you hear these things that challenge you, that, that, that make you look at your Bible with new eyes, do that. Ask God, is what is being told to me right? Show me in your word, Lord. And then once you've seen it in the word, then feel free to ask, and, and you too. But guys, it's way too easy to try to let other people tell you what to believe. Just remember, like I said, there are times in history when that would have gotten you exactly the opposite result. It would have caused you to continue to perpetuate and believe lies and even could have cost you or your loved one's salvation. If you'd rejected Jesus Christ, would you have been saved? No. But everyone would have told you he wasn't the Messiah. He was a fraud. He was a fake. But was he? No, he was real. He was the king. Right? Think of the misery you'd be under right now if you didn't know that you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, by what he did for us alone, and you thought you had to earn your way to heaven and work your way. You'd never have peace that you had done enough. But right now, if you believe at this moment that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that He died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead, you can have eternal peace because it is said that you are saved by believing that. That's the main thing. It is that simple. And I think that's where I want to, to, to go out with today is, is the simplicity of that. I'm going to put off this week getting into the kingdom issues. I'm going to save them for next week. But I want to reiterate how important it is to believe the Word when the Word tells you something, right? You can trust it. Now, let's, let's just take ourselves back. Before we delve into this new Reformation, let's go back to that second Reformation one more time. And let's remember that people are telling you that you have to do all these works and et cetera, do, do a number of things to be saved and that you can't even know for sure, okay? And let's, let's go to John... 3.16 and we'll start before that though everybody knows John 3.16 but not very often do we take the time to, to go back and, and read what's before it and if you'll permit me I'm going to look at my notes here for a moment while we all get there John 3, 16. So for some of y'all that are wondering what I'm doing right now, I am doing what's, what's called calling an audible. I've decided to, to postpone the, the modern Reformation one to, to hammer down on this one more time. I think it's very important that we do so. To prepare people for the fact that they're going to be shocked, right? So what I want to do is let's start in John 3. And let's look at... Will it help if I went to John? Let's look at verses 14 and 15. And if you have the red letter editions, you'll notice that this is actually Jesus talking here. And that the scripture, John 3, 16, is, is uh, not actually what he quoted, but restating what he quoted. Now, this is what Jesus Christ himself, the Lord of glory, said when he was on earth. He said, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. Did you capture that? How many of y'all have heard that story about when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness? Do you know what was going on at that time? And I apologize, in my notes, I've, I had the reference, and I, I may wind up finding it, but they're a little bit, uh, 
It's in, I believe it's in Numbers. Yeah, look at Numbers 21.8. I found it. I'm not as disorganized as I thought. Let's go to Numbers 21.8. So what is Jesus talking about? All of a sudden, Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. Numbers 21.8. Anybody not there? Well, I'm going to back up. Let's go, let's go back to 21 and 4. They, that's the Israelites, they traveled from Mount Hor, this is when they're in the wilderness, along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake. and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Look and live. That is the message of the gospel. That's what Jesus said. Now you go back to that verse in John. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Why? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Think how simple that is, guys. Let me ask you, if, if we're in the Old Testament right now, and all of a sudden some of those venomous snakes work their way up here on the porch, and they bite you, and you're dying, and I tell you, well, just pretend this is the serpent on the pole. I say, oh, look, look at this, guys. Look at this and you'll live. And you look at this and you live. How simple is that? Right? That's what Jesus is saying. If you know that you are dead in sin, that you're a sinner, and that you're going to die, and you do not deserve to be with God, if you will look unto Jesus Christ and believe that He is your Savior, that He died for you, you will be saved. There are no works. You see how easy it is. How simple it is. A child can understand it. Yet it can take us our entire life to fully comprehend it, right? It is wonderful. Now, now imagine, guys, that we're back in, that, in the 1500s and the church is telling you, no, no, that's, that's, that's impossible. You can't be saved by something that simple, right? Let's look at one other example of simple saving faith. How about, let's go back to 2 Kings 5.10. I'll run you around the Bible just a little bit today. But this is one of my favorite stories because this is another example of something so simple that it was rejected by people. There were people that said, there's no way you can be saved. How can, how can one person be you know, saved by just believing something? Well, this is about a, a man named Naaman, okay? I'm just going to read through, start it at uh, verse 1, but it goes through uh, 10. Now, Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, leprosy back then was very serious, right? It's just uh, your, your skin is going to deteriorate. Your limbs are going to fall off. You can't be around anyone. Now, bands of raiders... From Aram had gone and taken captive a young girl from Israel. She served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now, leprosy was incurable. But this girl is saying, Look, if you can go see this prophet, then you can be cured. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left. 
taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. Why was he taking all that? Because he knew he was going somewhere to ask something, and he wanted to bring things to pay for it, right? The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent them this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, washed and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel, so please accept the gift from your servant. He did not accept the gift. But do you see, guys, the thing? This man had an incurable disease, and all the prophet of God told him he had to do was go wash in this river seven times. Well, he's just like, why did I have to come here? I've got rivers back home. He said, no, because this is what God has told you to do. Just do it, and you'll be cleansed. Well, he went away mad at first. He's like, that's impossible, he said, right? That's not going to work. That's not going to do anything. But it did. The man obeyed God, washed in the river seven times, and was cleansed from his leprosy. The Israelites obeyed Moses, looked at the serpent on the pole, and they were saved. They were cured. Jesus was crucified on the cross for us. We believe upon him, and we are saved from our sins. That's what Jesus was saying in John 3. It's that simple. Do you see how simple it is? Do you need to bring a bunch of money and gifts to the church to give to them so that you can get this, like Naaman was trying to do? Remember, he packed up all these things to take? And then he tried to give him something for him, and the prophet said, no, no, I don't, I don't want or need your things. That's not what it's about. You can't buy salvation. You can't buy a cure. You can't buy healing. It's by faith in Jesus Christ alone. That was the message in the last Reformation. That's what we stand on today. It's that simple. Do you have faith in Christ Jesus? Then you can know for sure that you're saved because of what he did for you. He paid the price for your sins, and he rose from the dead. And your sins are forgiven. Now, grow in him and walk in him, of course. But that's the message. So that, that's just going to lay the foundation for next week, guys. Like I said, I'm going to tell you some things next week that you're going to say, what? It's going to be like that naming guy. Go wash in a river seven times. That's what you're telling me. That doesn't make sense. <coughs> or you're going to tell me that, no, this, this Jesus is the Son of God, the, the Messiah. And you're going to say, yeah, but that's not what the chief priests tell me. That's not what the, the church is telling me, so to speak. That's not what I'm hearing. And what do you have to do? You have to go back to the Bible and read it and see if these things that we say are not true. Because, guys, here's the bottom line. I believe that as a preacher of the Word, my main job is to glorify Christ, but to give you strength edification and encouragement and i want you to go away today encouraged that the king of kings the lord of lords has saved you and that you are living in his kingdom and that we're going to go forth from here now and have a life that is full of joy in him and that's what we'll, we'll come back to those passages in isaiah but remember what they said 
Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. He says, lift up your eyes and look about you. He says, then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. That's what our life is supposed to be on this earth. Hearts filled with joy and peace. Paul says in Romans 15, 13, that the God of peace fill you with, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what our, our life is meant to be. We're supposed to be living full of joy in this world, in this kingdom of Christ. And I'm going to close with one more verse out of Revelation 11, 15. And it says that the kingdoms of this world, okay, I'll say it, because I'm trying to memorize it the best I can. It's 1115b. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. Let's just dwell on that one. That's what we're going to get into, guys. This kingdom, the kingdoms of this world, what does it say? They have become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ, Right? And how long is Jesus Christ going to reign according to this? For a short time. For a thousand years. For ten thousand years. No. How long? Forever and ever. And of his kingdom there will be no end <coughs> to your descendants forever and ever. So let's enjoy the fact, revel in what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Take great delight and joy that we are saved in Him, that we know that Jesus is the King, that we're standing on the shoulders of these other two reformations we've talked about. And now we can boldly go into this third reformation and challenge the fact that there are people today, as we'll look at next week, who are telling us that this kingdom is not here now. It's not, it's not now. And that all things are, are dire and, and going to heck in a handbasket. And there is no hope. And we're here to tell you, no, that this world is the kingdom of the great King, Jesus Christ. And He reigns now and forever. And it is, it is ours to go and fill and subdue, be fruitful and multiply, and to subdue to His will. So let's, let's take that as a, an encouragement today. I hope that, that today you're strengthened and encouraged that your Savior is the King of kings and that you're living in his kingdom and we'll begin to explore that how do we know that by what the scriptures tell us we'll go into that let's let's pray together lord thank you for this time that we can come and get in your word and and hear from you and lord i i thank you that our light has come that the glory of your your glory oh lord rises upon us thank you lord and we look to you, God, and we are radiant. Our hearts throb and swell with joy with the fact that you have saved us and that we will never die. But we will live with you for eternity, forever and ever, and all because and only because of what your Son, Jesus Christ, has done for us by your great love and compassion and mercy which you had upon us. Thank you for that, Lord God. Give us boldness, God. Give us courage to live for you this week, to glory in your name and to thank you. And prepare us, God. Prepare your church all over the world for this new reformation that needs to come so that people can believe that Jesus Christ is reigning now and that this world belongs to him and that everyone who pretends to be the ruler of this world besides Jesus Christ is an imposter and a pretender and must be dethroned and called to repentance and proclaimed to bow before the King, Jesus Christ. Let it be, O oh God, for your glory. Thank you, God, that the kingdoms of this earth have become your kingdom and of your Christ, and you shall reign forever and ever. We look to you, God. In Jesus' holy, mighty name we pray. Amen.